It's a common scene in film, television, and gaming to see military commanders huddled around a battlefield map planning their next moves with miniature armies. While this looks great visually, did it really happen? It turns out that this common trope is largely a Hollywood fabrication. In this video, we'll be discussing how people in the past actually plan their strategies and when the idea of battlefield planning with maps first became a reality. The reason these battlefield map scenes are so believable is that it just seems so intuitively logical. How else would you go about planning something as complex as a battle or a campaign? However, we must remember that this thinking is very much a product of our modern mindset. Day in and day out, we are bombarded with 2D representations of nearly everything and have grown used to thinking in abstractions. Detailed maps in particular are so ubiquitous that it would be folly to go without one. Just imagine trying to travel across the country without GPS navigation. Now imagine trying to travel across the country without a highway map. This is the world of the past we are dealing with. A past where people did not have access to the same levels of cartography as us, and thus had to frame their world in an entirely different way. Rather than describing a trip from the vantage point of a bird, it was described from the far more natural vantage point of the ground. Travel from point A to point B was therefore governed by important landmarks and distances along a path between them. One should imagine this more like traveling along a metro line. As an example, here is an account from Xenophon's Anabasis, as he describes a march from Sardis to Babylon. Cyrus was now setting forth from Sardis, and he marched through Lydia, three stages, a distance of 22 parasangs, to the Minda River. After crossing, he marched through Phrygia, one stage, a distance of 8 parasangs, to Colossae, an inhabited city, large and prosperous. There he remained 7 days. Thence he marched three stages, twenty parasangs, to Selene, an inhabited city of Phrygia, large and prosperous. Here Cyrus remained thirty days, and held a review of the Greeks in the park, and they amounted all told to eleven thousand hoplites and about two thousand peltists. Thence he marched two stages, ten parasangs, to Pelti, an inhabited city. There he remained three days. Thence he marched two stages, twelve parasangs, to the inhabited city of Ceremonagora, the last Phrygian city, as one goes to Mycia. Here is an actual visualization of this type of route map from a Roman soldier. This fragment, preserved on a legionary leather shield cover, shows the path of his army unit through Crimea as chronicled solely by the places they passed. Here is another example in the form of a road network map of the Roman world. Just for comparison, here's what the map would have looked like if we warp it to fit our more modern perspective. I hope these examples have demonstrated how people of the past would have more commonly thought of and communicated travel plans as a series of steps between known points. This isn't to say that bird's eye view maps did not exist. They did. But they were just not very geographically precise over large distances, especially past coastlines. This meant that maps as depicted in modern media would generally not have been available to commanders for planning purposes, and they wouldn't think to use them. Okay, so if ancient generals did not use maps as we have imagined, then how on earth did they plan their battles? Well, ultimately we think of maps as necessary for two main reasons. The first reason being the information they convey about the battlefield, and the second reason being their practicality for commanding an army. Let's start by discussing the first reason, which regards battlefield information. Commanders in the past certainly did need this information, it's just that it was not readily available in the form of maps. Rather, generals would rely on live reconnaissance to report back on their surroundings. This was ultimately far more practical, at a time when the fog of war was so dense and one did not have stacks of maps at the ready to be consulted. Scouts or local guides could also report back on a variety of other important factors, such as the presence of supplies, favorable campsites, or the disposition of enemy forces. For example, it was local fishermen who told the Roman general Publius Cornelius Scipio that at low tide he would be able to sneak troops across a bay to assault the city of New Carthage, and it was a traitorous Greek who led the Persians through a goat path around the bottleneck at Thermopylae. These sorts of reports were often relayed to the general second hand. Yet it was not uncommon for the commander themselves to get the lay of the land with their own eyes. This was the favored approach of great generals such as Julius Caesar. As an example, 
Hannibal Barca spent weeks surveying the battlefield of Cannae that was to be the canvas for his famous tactical masterpiece. Sometimes, however, all this live reconnaissance was not necessary to understand a battlefield. Greek warfare in particular saw combat take place in the same locations for centuries on end. With such battlefields so commonly used for war, the combatants on both sides would have been quite familiar with the terrain ahead of time. One might think that all this information would be difficult to keep track of without the visual aid of a map. While this line of thinking does have some merit, we must however remember the far more limited scope and complexity of combat in the past. Armies numbered in the tens of thousands and were so densely packed that even the largest battle lines stretched out no more than a few kilometers of frontage. Therefore, you did not really have to take in too much information. Just know where the high ground is to position your men, where the river is to anchor your flank, and where the scrubs are to hide an ambush. To illustrate this idea, there's a pretty awesome anecdote about Julius Caesar actually dictating a battle from within his tent, issuing moves and counter moves based just on the messages he receives from the field. Okay, so maybe at this point you can hopefully accept that armies could navigate their surroundings without traditional maps, and that great generals could have a pretty robust mental image of what was going on around them. But surely, you might wonder, wouldn't a map be necessary to effectively communicate the general's plan of action? Wouldn't this be the best way to effectively transfer the complexities of a battle plan from the mind of a leader down to the rank and file? Answering this question now brings us to a discussion of the second reason for using maps, their use as practical tools for command. Once again, our modern minds will need some adjustments. Hence, we must reframe our concept of warfare. In the age of sword and shield, battles were fought face to face between tightly packed blocks of soldiers, whose total number was kept small by the demographic, logistical, and organizational limitations of their societies. This is to be contrasted with the age of gunpowder where battles are fought at great distances between huge numbers of soldiers mobilized by highly advanced societies. As an example, compare for instance the war plans of Alexander the Great with those of the German army in the First World War. To further illustrate this leap in scope and scale, we can conduct a mental exercise. Imagine for a moment battle plans for a 21st century conflict. Now, imagine what some future war on a galactic scale would look like. The difference is massive. With this contrast in mind, this should hopefully drive home the point that combat in the past was just not as complex as we would imagine today. In fact, one could argue that things actually had to be simple to work. This is because battles in antiquity were ultimately just a big game of chicken. In these endurance contests of morale, the best way to achieve victory was to ensure your troops were psychologically fortified. To put things bluntly, for animalistic reasons, soldiers have better morale when kept in tight formation with their comrades, almost like being in a herd. Thus, a loss of cohesion, or a separation from the herd, meant a loss in morale, which could ultimately snowball into a rout and a panic. Combat wasn't the only thing that could cause such an effect. In fact, any sort of motion would risk breaking a unit's cohesion. Anyone who has tried to move in a coordinated group will have experienced this. As a result, most military units just wouldn't be capable of performing anything complex at all. It was actually pretty hard to just turn around. Even walking forwards in a straight line could be an issue. Uneven ground and the idiosyncrasies of soldiers' strides inevitably caused formations to ripple. If left unchecked, these would cause units to disintegrate into mobs. It was therefore imperative for officers to constantly dress the line just to make it into contact with the enemy in one piece. Take the famous Battle of Cannae as an example of what I'm talking about. Here, the Roman plan essentially boiled down to forming their entire infantry into a wrecking ball with high morale and ramming it straight through the enemy front line. The Carthaginian plan that made Hannibal famous ultimately wasn't that much more complicated either and can be described quite easily. Consider also that most battles wouldn't even approach this level of complexity. That's not to say that generals bash their armies together like rocks or anything. It's just that the realities of the time meant that there was no sophisticated pre-planned choreography at work here. This should hopefully all go to proving that simple plans really were standard operating procedure. These would not require a map to communicate. 
Instead, the plan would generally be discussed between the general and their officers before battle, and the basic orders were disseminated to the troops by voice, by instrument, or by flag. Most people with combat experience will also be quick to tell you that no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Thus, these simple plans were actually quite robust. Any quick response on the fly thinking would have to be done on the local level. This is actually one of the reasons why the Roman army was so successful, because its small units under the control of veteran centurions could leverage superior tactical flexibility to defeat their more static opponents. To illustrate ancient command and control in practice, I'd like to read you some passages from Thucydides, which describes Greek forces planning their operations. Here is an account of forces being instructed on how to approach the battlefield. Aegis, instead of taking this road as his Argive enemies expected, gave the Lacedaemonians, Arcadians, and Epidorians their orders, and went along another, difficult road, and descended into the plain of Argos. The Corinthians, Pelennians, and Philassians marched by another steep road, while the Boeotians, Megarians, and Sicyonians had instructions to come down by the Nemean road, where the Argives were posted, in order that if the enemy advanced into the plain against the troops of Aegis, they might fall upon his rear with their cavalry. Here's an account describing a battle plan. The army of the Peloponnesians was the largest and outflanked their opponents, and Demosthenes, fearing that his right might be surrounded, placed an ambush in a hollow way overgrown with bushes, some 400 heavy infantry and light troops, who were to rise up at the moment of the onset behind the projecting left wing of the enemy and to take them in the rear. Here's another account of specific orders for coordinating an attack. I, with the men under my command, will, if possible, take them by surprise and fall with a run upon the center. And do you, Clearidas, afterwards, when you see me already upon them, and as is likely, dealing terror among them, take with you the Amphipolitans and the rest of the allies, and suddenly open the gates and dash at them, and hasten to engage as quickly as you can. And lastly, here's a slightly longer account of a flanking maneuver being planned and executed on the fly. For a long time, indeed for most of the day, both sides held out against all the torments of the battle, thirst, and sun. The one, endeavoring to drive the enemy from the high ground, the other, to maintain himself upon it. It being now more easy for the Lacedaemonians to defend themselves than before, as they could not be surrounded upon the flanks. The struggle began to seem endless when the commanders of the Mycenaeans, the Athenians' local allies, came to Cleon and Nebosthenes and told them that they were losing their labor but that, if they would give him some archers and light troops to go round on the enemy's rear by a way he would undertake to find, he thought he could force the approach. Upon receiving what he asked for, he started from a point out of sight in order not to be seen by the enemy, and creeping on wherever the precipices of the island permitted, and where the Lacedaemonians, trusting to the strength of the ground, kept no guard, succeeded after the greatest difficulty in getting round without their seeing him and suddenly appeared on the high ground in their rear, to the dismay of the surprised enemy and still greater joy of his expectant friends. Thus, in this example you can see how a flanking maneuver wasn't something that had to be specified in great detail from a battle map. Rather, the commander just had to deploy the troops in the correct position and give their subordinates some general commands. Stay out of sight, wait for our lines to meet, hit them from the rear by that hill. It's quite simple in principle. But I'll have to admit that this system did have its flaws. Sometimes, these simple orders might result in a failed operation. For instance, at Dyrrhachium, when Caesar ordered his troops to assault one of Pompey's fortified camps, some units were commanded to find the walls of the camp and follow them around to the rear. However, when they found that wall and began to follow it, they mistook another set of fortifications as a continuation of the fort and ended up wandering off the battlefield. In this case, a detailed map would have helped. But at the end of the day, it's not like modern forces haven't gotten similarly turned around with much better navigational tools. The forces of chaos are always at work in combat situations. In the end, the people of the past simply made do with what they had. They were every bit as ingenious as we are, but were handed a different set of tools by the fate of time. Thus, to reiterate, battle maps as depicted in modern media are not historical for the following reasons. The ancient world was experienced from the ground level, rather than a bird's eye view. 
battlefield information was more easily relayed in real time than by maps. And lastly, battle plans were ultimately quite simple and did not require maps to explain. However, as battles got more complex, things would change. This was especially true with the advent of gunpowder and massive troop conscription, which saw an explosion in the complexities of war. Thus, the necessities of battlefield maps grew. Such a need was served by, and even drove, the development of more advanced cartography. Soon battlefield maps were actually a real thing. By the 18th century, they were a common feature at headquarters and became quite popular in military schools. The Prussian game of Kriegspiel is a famous example, which we will explore in a future video. But for now, it's here that I'd like to conclude our episode. A huge thanks is owed to our supporters on Patreon and the many talented researchers, writers, and artists who made this video possible. Please consider contributing to fund future content. If you found this topic interesting, check out these related videos about our fascinating past. Be sure to like and subscribe for more history, and check out our description for ways to support the channel. Thanks for watching.